it's so easy to portray online that like you have everything together and your life is so great and that's probably how my life looked but there was a point in time where I was just so unhappy and I felt like I didn't have anything. I'm sure like you'll probably have heard this from so many different people online and it's nothing new but I just wanted to remind you that everything that you see online is not real <laughs> and a lot of the times people behind these social media accounts are going through some really real stuff da -da 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 -da. i never heard anyone blame the technology of the telephone for the lies they told i never heard anyone say well you know it's really easy for people to get the wrong idea when all you're doing is communicating with them by telephone to update them about what's going on in your life. I never heard anyone try to shift blame onto the printed page or the humble pen by saying, well, you know, it's really easy to mislead people. It's just really easy for people to get the wrong impression about what's going on in your life when they only communicate with you, you know, through the written word. And of course, there's some truth to that. I think it's easier to lie to people over the telephone than face-to-face. -face. It's probably easier to lie in the written word than the spoken word, right? But we don't forget who it is that's doing the lying, who it is that's misleading, and who it is that's being misled. What I find disturbing about Maddie's approach to this issue here is the extent to which she's willing to shift the blame onto social media, onto the technology itself, right? Like, oh, it's just, it's just so easy for people to get the wrong impression about what's going on in your life. It's so easy for people to get misled. They get misled because you're misleading them, right? They get lied to because you are the liar. And you don't learn from making this mistake. You don't learn from your own past duplicity because you don't even recognize it as your own. You don't look back on it as your responsibility. You just see it as a funny thing that somehow your audience got the wrong idea or that somehow the medium itself is misleading. And you know what? There is a sense in which the telephone is misleading. There's a sense in which the newspaper article is misleading. And there is a sense in which if the only way your parents knew what was going on in your life was through handwritten letters, probably you would have a huge struggle just to let your parents know what really was going on in your life, to really get it across to them what the situation is through the written word and to not let them be misled. I think all of us have to face up to a higher level of responsibility than just not lying, right? Than just not being, you know, not being a scam artist, right? I think all of us actually have to deal with a much higher level of responsibility of not misleading people or not allowing people to mislead themselves, not allowing people to be misled, maybe when you have no, no bad intentions yourself, right? One of my most directly felt reasons for being honest with people, maybe a strange way to put it, but I mean it, one of the reasons I have for being disruptively honest with people that I feel keenly and immediately in those moments when I'm dealing with them is the element of the unknown. A lot of times there's social pressure on me to just tell kind of convenient half-truths and lies, right? And then we all know what's going to happen next in that conversation. Everyone's going to say, oh, oh, good for you. Good to hear that. Oh, yeah, hmm, yeah, good. The conversation is kind of going to come from nowhere and go nowhere because of the lack of honesty. And again, I'm, I'm not just talking about outright lies here, right? Just allowing people to be misled sometimes in ways that nobody is gonna, nobody's gonna complain about afterwards as having been a, a lie. I remember I spoke to a young woman who was studying to get a PhD in anthropology. And she told me that she was just buying a airplane ticket to go and do some kind of special internship, for lack of a better word, kind of a study placement with a certain university in Thailand where she was going to learn all about Buddhism. 
So at that time, I was deep into whatever my decade of being a scholar of Buddhism was pretty much at the end of it. And I'd been to that university and I'd met those professors. I'd been in that department. I'd been to that university with my own interest being in, in Buddhist studies. And of course, it would have been the easiest thing in the world for me to say, good for you. Oh, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. Or I, I could have even, you know, uh, done sort of name dropping and say, oh, say hello to Professor so-and-so when you're there. I remember I had a cup of tea with him the last time I visited, was the last time I visited the campus, you know, oh, oh, really? Hello. Mm, oh, yes. You know, you can have this kind of polite society level of perpetually dishonest discourse. All right. And I didn't do that. All right. I was honest. <laughs> I was honest in a way that wouldn't allow her to mislead herself. And I told her that she's probably going to the one place in Thailand where she will learn absolutely nothing about Buddhism, where she could learn more by staying in the airport lobby and interviewing airport staff about what's going on in Buddhism in Thailand rather than going to this university and dealing with the particular professors there, right? Now, I could hear digress into why that is, but she was going into a really terrible situation. And I knew it. I knew it would be a disaster. And I also knew I'd never hear back from her about what happened afterwards. So she went away to Thailand. Months later, she came back. And my wife bumped into her. I wasn't there. She had this conversation. My wife, now my ex-wife. <laughs> my wife bumped into her. And she said, so, you know, how were things with the, the placement, the special assignment you did in, in Thailand? And of course, this woman, she stiffened right up and, you know, told the most unconvincing lie in the world, which certainly in British culture is, you know, requisite. Oh, oh, fine. It was, it was great. Everything was really, oh, it's, you know. Um, one of the fundamental reasons I have for honesty is that I think people don't learn from the exchange of lies. And I think that we really do learn and we learn unexpected things from being honest with others and being honest with ourselves. Now, this same woman uh, was a PhD student at the time. You know, she had an article that she co-wrote. She was part of a circle of authors who wrote this terrible article. And she'd shown that article to a huge number of people before publication, not just formal peer review. And she showed it to me, right? And I told her, this is through email correspondence. I, I think this was probably the last conversation we had by email, because she never typed me of that. I told her in no uncertain terms, this is garbage. And very fundamentally, you are illiterate in the language that you are quoting which was Pali, whereas it's a language I can read. You're lying about what the text says. You're lying about what it means. This whole article is based on a series of, of lies, and you're not even aware of the extent to which you're lying because you can't read the text you're quoting from. Like Everything about this article was mind-blowingly awful, and I wasn't, I, mean, I wasn't being cruel to her, right? I was being honest. And I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't just being honest. I was putting her in a position where she couldn't mislead herself. Now, there's several different elements of honesty and dishonesty that follow soon after this. One of them is, in her reply to me by email, it was very brief, but she just said something like, well, you know, um, nevertheless, this was a good heuristic device for exploring the issue. She, she made this completely nonsensical uh, academic, uh, this statement couched in needlessly obscure academic language uh, that, you know, nevertheless, this was, a, despite everything that may be factually wrong with the article, nevertheless, this had some kind of tremendous um, positive value. Um, all right. Same woman, some number of days or weeks later, I forget, bumps into my ex-wife in a grocery store, <laughs> my wife of the time. All right. She bumps into her in a grocery store. She knows who she is. She knows her connection to me. And in no time flat, no context in the like vegetable aisle, she breaks down weeping. All right. She breaks down weeping to my ex-wife about how dramatically this email I sent impacted her, where I was pointing out, here's what's wrong with your article. Bang, 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 bang. And not 
not stating it in any uncertain or equivocal or flattering terms. It was honest, but it was factual. It was poor. And she's weeping in the produce section when she bumps into my ex-wife. And what my ex-wife told me, she said, one of the main things she said to her is, you know, she, you know, Eisel is really honest with people. Like, he's trying to help you. And when he said in that message that he's telling you this because no one else will tell you, and there were very few other experts alive who can tell you, and the ones that are alive, the other experts that they won't tell you, they won't be honest. You know, he's really honest. Like, you have to know this. Like, he's really honest. And of course, if you can value it, right, that would make me, uh, that would make me uh, valuable for my honesty, right? So already there's an interesting gap there, right? She could have sent an email to me. She could have said to me, honestly, that this was extremely upsetting for her, right? She could have had that conversation with me, right? She didn't. She repressed it. She sent me a totally dishonest email. And then this, you know, repressed, uh, maybe she wept silently with no one hearing her before this. Maybe she wept alone in her apartment. But then obviously this came out when she happened to bump into my ex-wife. And they were not friends. They, they weren't just not close friends. They were not friends, period, the two of them. So this is her breaking down weeping with a complete stranger at the, at the grocery store, right? <laughs> Now, if she, had, if she had been honest with me, you know, if she had written back to me honestly with email, you can imagine that conversation could have gone further, right? Same thing about that university in Thailand she was going to. If she had been honest with me, we could have had a really productive conversation or a series of conversations about doing research on Buddhism in Thailand and what she could do with limited, limited time and limited money. So, like, they're really a lot positive coming out of that, right? But she couldn't be honest. Now, another thing caught my eye about that article and there was a professor whom I knew um, thanked in the footnotes. He and I had gone through different periods of talking a lot about our research and then not talking at all. But he was someone I had an intense and uh, tempestuous friendship with. He was someone I met face to face just once. We talked for several hours and otherwise the whole relationship was by email. Um, he was a very passionate, deeply flawed scholar of Buddhism. Um, but I'd known him already at that time for many years. And you know what? He probably regarded me also as a very passionate and deeply flawed scholar of Buddhism, uh, to be fair, right? Um, he had some disadvantages compared to me, though. Uh, he had a PhD, which is a big advantage. But uh, he was dyslexic. I don't think he really had any ability in the languages concerned like Pali. But if he did, you know, he, he had really severe dyslexia. His ability to use that knowledge of language would be very limited. I wrote to him and said, look, you know, I just had this young scholar, this PhD candidate here, show me this article. And, you know, I see your name thanked on it. I can't believe I can't believe you signed off on this. Like when she showed this to you, I couldn't say, why didn't you tell her what I told her? Right? I can't quite say that. But I could say, um, you know, I could say, why weren't you honest with her? Why weren't you honest with her about how, how bad and wrong this is, you know? And <laughs> you know what? In that conversation too, at first, he wanted to just make the question disappear with some vague pleasantries. And not in a rude way, because I, I, I assumed he had just kind of told her nothing. I assumed he had just sent her like the equivalent of a Twitter response. He sent her a two sentence response saying, yeah, yeah, whatever, publish it. Like that was what I assumed. Um, so I was just trying to have a productive conversation with him. I said, well, look, here are the things I really found outstandingly wrong about it. And here's why I think it's really important to let people know. That, you know, I was talking through in a meaningful sense why it's important for people like him and people like me, but a person like him in a position of power, to really let students know when they're factually wrong about this kind of thing and they're on the wrong track coming further. So I kept, in effect, kept pressing in this conversation. And then he took the time to write me a long email saying that, look, when he received that essay, there was so much wrong with it. And he said, this, 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 and this, you know, pointing out what was wrong with that. And he said, if she took that constructive criticism and then flushed it down the toilet and ignored it, that's none of his business, but he did what he could because he thought. And then at that moment, so he hadn't seen the final published article. He'd only seen it when he showed it. 
And I said to him, well, look, this is hilarious. I'm so glad you told me that. All the things you just told me, the criticisms you gave her, what you said was wrong with her article, right? That she, cop she copied and pasted that out of your email and she put it in a footnote because there's a footnote here, like it's like footnote seven or something, which basically says like, oh yes, well, um, it may be that like every single thing claimed in this article is completely false. Like, it was just the most surreal footnote. It's like, it says like, well, some scholars may uh, contradict this point about this claim. Like, it was like this footnote indicating that somebody somewhere knows that this is complete bullshit, you know. But nevertheless, we're going to continue this, right? But here's the problem. Whatever wording he used when he told her this, he might have thought he was being honest. Right? In a sense, he was. right, But he wasn't being honest enough. His way of putting it to her was delicate enough, was discreet enough, was indirect enough, or was even dishonest enough that she could continue to mislead herself. Right? There's a difference between just telling the truth. There's a difference between just not lying, just not being a scam artist, and really being disruptively honest in a way so that people are not misled or so that people can't continue to be misled because they may already want to believe something without you coming out and lying to them. Right? It's easier to visualize this when we're talking about one-to-one -one relationships, like your relationship with your own parents. Right? Again, if you were writing letters longhand, you've moved to a new city, you've started a new life, and you're trying to let your parents know what's going on, think about what a creative writing challenge that is. And think about how different your parents' impression might be if they were receiving those letters for a number of years and then suddenly they showed up at your apartment and saw the reality of what you're like. They show up unannounced, uninvited, unex unexpected. And they say, whoa, this was the impression I got from the letters and now here I see how you're really living and what your life is really about, right? for better or worse, right? And you might feel that you weren't trying to mislead them in those letters, but maybe you weren't being honest enough, right? And it does take creativity and it does take energy and effort. And frankly, it takes a willingness to make people break down crying in the fucking supermarket in the produce section, right? You have to be willing to really take it that far. Right? I got fan mail last time. The last time I talked about the difference between mere honesty and this higher level of not letting people be misled. You know, I think every single piece of fan mail I got related to people's romantic lives. It wasn't that, I forget if it was four people or five people. Nobody wrote to me about their professional lives that way. Probably some people not answer. Yeah, I know what it's like to have a boss or an employee or a coworker. And the difference between telling the truth and making sure people aren't being misled about a work situation that brings a lot of stories to mind for me, also, right? Like, look, do you have any idea how many situations I've been in where I could have made a lot of money just by letting people be misled, right? Do you have any idea? how many situations I've been in where I could have had sex with a very attractive woman just by letting her be misled. Like, where I don't even have to lie because she's already lying to herself. Like, she already wants this. I just got to let her tell the lies herself. And it's like, no, I've got a commitment to my personal integrity where I'd rather live in poverty than make money by living a lie or where I'd rather live in relative celibacy. <laughs> I'd rather not... Have sex with someone at all if it's going to be on this basis, even even if the lies, you know, are lies that I have not told, right? But when I'm in these situations, I've got to tell you, I personally, I don't feel temptation. I don't. <laughs> um, <coughs> when I'm in these situations, what I feel most immediately is that question of what's unknown. Because if I lie, even if I lie just a little bit, if I'm just a little bit dishonest and give someone a pleasant answer that lets everyone kind of go home and, you know, enjoy their life, lets everyone shake hands and part company on good terms and nobody breaks down weeping at the grocery store. You know, if I do that, I'll never know what would have happened next, what would have been revealed if I'd really been honest. That's always what I feel 
you know, urgently in the moment is, if I'm not honest about this now, you know, then I'll never know, I'll never find out. And part of what you're finding out is who that other person really is and how they really feel and who you really are. A little bit too, a little, a little tiny part of yourself that you might have concealed from yourself. A little tiny part of how you feel, right? You might be, conceal conceal you might be concealing some of your own feelings from yourself even, right? And that will also, you know, uh, come to the surface. I had a brief conversation, it was very memorable, with a woman who had a crush on me five years ago before I'd met Melissa. Melissa is my current super high commitment long-term partner, right? And truth be told, five years ago or whatever the hell it was now, it might be closer to six years ago now, you know what? I was interested in her too. And at that time, neither one of us admitted to the other, right? So we were, we were just friends, right? A million years go by, we don't talk. I have a long-term high commitment relationship. She has some number of long-term high commitment relationships, you know, whatever. You know, she gets back in touch with me and the reality of the situation is I'm talking to her and I'm interested in being just friends, you know? And this, this most recent conversation after, and just like that woman getting the PhD in Buddhism, maybe I'll never hear from her again because I chose to be honest, right? But I still choose that. I'd still prefer that silence than having a friendship that's based on phoniness and lies and deception and self-deception, right? This most recent conversation I had with her, you know, right at the beginning, she was writing to me and asking, in effect, what kind of relationship we had and what kind of relationship we could have going forward. And I was saying, look, I'm, I'm out here looking for a kind of intellectual relationship. And I sent her a link to a YouTube video where I was talking about the books I was reading and what kind of research I was doing, what was going on in my life. I said, yeah, I was saying, in effect, look, we can be friends, but this is what's going on in my life intellectually. And if you want to be a part of that, you can jump in and you're welcome. But, you know, that's, that's all that's there for you. And I said several times in several different ways that no, there was no possibility of a romantic uh, relationship between us and I you know I'm also not single but I mean that's not enough you've really got to be honest with people because tr trust me if you're not honest there are people who will wait for years for when you are single right like like if you just say oh well I'm not single some people are going to interpret that as oh okay I'll call back when you are you know <laughs> that's not the message you want the other person to be picking up here right so this, this conversation, you know, went on to a point where she was getting more insistent and more demanding about what kind of relationship she wanted to have with me. And she said right at the beginning that she wanted to be an exclusive relationship also. And like, from I remember, I was, I'm dialing up and looking at the earlier messages, like nothing I was saying before this was unclear. You know, like, I don't think I've been leading around. I'm not leading around. Like I'm going back and looking. It's like, okay, you know what? I'm going to really be honest because if I'm not honest, I'd never know, you know, I'd never know if I could be friends with this person. If there is, you know, I'd never know, you know, whatever, what I meant to her in the past or why it is she thinks this way about me now. If I'm dishonest, right? And I said to her, look, the truth is, yes, you know, more than five years ago, I had a crush on you and you had a crush on me. And we really didn't know very much about each other. You know, I know you a lot better now. And the truth is, it's not possible. Nothing like this ever was possible between us. There is no parallel universe in which you turned out to be the mother of my children. There is no alternate reality in which you and I ended up as a couple and you were raising my daughter. That, that just doesn't exist. That's just not possible. We just don't have that much in common. And I think it's fair to say she is never going to talk to me again. From my perspective, I'm being really honest on social media all the time. I'm not misleading. I'm not claiming to be single when I'm attached. I'm not, you know, I think there's no smokescreen whatsoever. But one thing she said really briefly in passing during that conversation, which was a mix of voice and text, 
she said really briefly, well, I don't even know if you're single. Because, I mean, looking through your social media, it looks like you are. She said some words to that effect. And when she said that, it struck me. I was like, whoa. It has never occurred to me that someone could like scroll through my YouTube videos and like just read the titles and through the magic of like seeing only what you want to see, you know, engaging in cherry picking the same way Christians read the Bible and they only pick out the passages that suit their own agenda, right? That someone could scroll through that, you know, and see me as single or see me as indicating that I've broken up my mother or that I'm available or that I'm looking for a part or anything like that, right? But that's the situation we're so often in here on social media, right? People find you, they have some clear notion of what you want to be in their minds. And if you aren't disruptively honest with them, if you don't take the time and make that effort, right, they will be misled. The deepest problem with what Maddie Limburner is doing here is that she is disclaiming responsibility for her own life of active deception. She's not coming on camera and saying that she now recognizes she has spent the last five years making money by deceiving the world. She is continuing to lead this much deeper lie. She's living this lie that she's being completely honest, but that somehow through the vagaries of social media, the people in her audience are deceiving themselves. Maybe we can we can practice. We can practice.